name is Barbara Kuhn. I'm a disability researcher okay. and also a mother of a 44-year-old son who is now having one day a week with NISA, but before that only <coughs> in the activities that we have in Sweden. And I was very much impressed with what you have been saying about the importance of experience. Mm -hmm. And that you can be, you have to be re thwarted. We have to learn again if you have been in bad circumstances like sheltered work shops and, and like the daily activities, which is only being there. You don't learn anything about real life. And I hope that these ideas that you have with preparing students early and give them community-based experience, etc., etc., will be a reality for young people. My son is old. What can we do for him? I'm so happy that he's with Misa, but, but uh, in Sweden we don't um, give much attention to those middle-aged persons with intellectual disabilities. But uh, I, I have much more hope for the young generation. But what I would like to ask you is, is how, how, how can we uh, change and reteach the persons? And what, what, uh, well, what did you mean with having the wrong experiences from uh, sheltered workshops, for instance? I had my students in, in sheltered workshops would do things exactly so. Like they come in and they put a hook, there'd be hooks by the door, they take their coat off, put their hooks on, and then they go and get their work and they go sit down in a certain chair and they do a certain thing when they're told and it's very boom, boom, boom. And they do it in a certain order. One day they were painting our room and they took off all the hooks. They, they took them off so they can paint the wall. And my students, I'm not making fun, this, this is actually how they were. They came in the room, they took their coats off and they, they stood there holding their coats they didn't know what to do because the hook was gone. And they were taught over the years to hang up your coat, go over to get this, go sit down. But because there wasn't a hook, they couldn't do the first step and they were done. They were never taught what to do otherwise or how to think outside of what they were taught to do. And I think that's one of the problems. If you all have jobs that you are supposed to do certain tasks. And if something comes up that uh, is different, you have to think for yourself. You have to get around that task. You have to clean things up. You have to do things that aren't necessarily told, you're told to do. So for example, I work with you know, a lot of pizza places or restaurants with my students. They have to realize that they have to clean this table. The table's dirty. I have to clean it. They can't wait for their boss to say, oh, clean that table. And then they clean the table. And 10 seconds later, the boss has to tell them something else. I think one of the problems that shelter workshops have is that they require that kind of regimented step-by-step -step process where they're told what to do. There isn't much individual work in the United States where they, they do things on their own, they do things where they're, uh, they go on and do tasks without being told. Everything is very regimented, very structured, and very um, directed. You're told what to do. That's not what, what reality is like in the community. You can't keep a job if you're always having to be told what to do. And I think that's one of the bigger problems that we have in sheltered settings. Um, they might learn a task at, at, at the table, you know, putting things together, but they're always told, okay, now do this, now do that, now do that. And, and you don't have any jobs in the community where you're always having a boss stand within five feet of you saying, now do this, now do that, now do that, break time, and then, you know, expecting them to come back and do it all over again. Um, and I think that's the biggest problem that they have to unlearn, the dependence on somebody telling them what to do all the time. And they don't learn that the problem solving. And I think problem solving is probably the most valuable skill that we can teach anybody, disabled or not. What do we do when your car doesn't break down? Uh, what do you do when the lights, I, I have so many students who can teach living skills, and they come into a room and they flip the switch for the light and the light doesn't go on. What do they do next? Flip it again. Still doesn't go on. So what do they do? Flip it again. That's all they know. They don't know how to change the light or how to check things. Or, or So I think one of the things that the shelter workshops doesn't teach is that notion of how do you solve an issue? How do you solve a problem? 
those kinds of things. Also, social skills, that's another big issue. The research has found in the United States the number one reason why people lose their jobs isn't because they can't do the work, it's because they don't know how to interrelate with other people. And that's one of the things that you don't learn in shelter workshops. You, you actually end up learning the behaviors of the people around you, which you're supposed to be unlearning in order to get to the community. Yeah. Um, I was just wondering if we can read your research somewhere. Oh, you want to read my research? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> My mother says my research is a good cure for her insomnia, so I don't know if you really want to... Literally, she says that. She has, she has a copy of my dissertation by her bed, and I was so proud that my mother was reading my research, and she said, oh, it's wonderful, it puts me right to sleep when I can't find <laughs> um, I Yes, you can certainly find my research, and you can, if you have any questions, if you want my research, if you want anything, if you want to talk, just email me. My email, email is right there. Um, but also, I have provided a copy of a literature review that has just been published that summarizes the past uh, 15 years of research in this area. Uh, most of it's mine, but it's, um, it's like 40 articles that I summarize. Uh, and I provide it, to, uh, provide it to the groups, and you can put it on your websites or whatever it is that you'd like to do. And if you, it, it, you don't really have to read it. I mean, that's very kind, but yes, if you want to, it, it's there for you. You can make a hat out of it or something. Hello, uh, just wonder, under which, which circumstances, if any, do you have the opportunity to show your figures to the politicians in the United States? From what I understand about the Scandinavian countries, there's a barrier between researchers and politicians. And I, I, don't, I don't know what the, the term is, but you have um, who are the middle, uh, middle people, um, bureaucrats? Uh, yeah, I don't know if that's bad or not, but I mean, sorry. But um, there's, there's, a, like, there's a buffer between. I have the good fortune of working with policymakers directly, and it's, uh, I'll tell you a quick story. I, I did my dissertation on this kind of analysis in Illinois, and I, for a couple years after my dissertation, I wanted to do more studies in more and more states with bigger and bigger samples, but I couldn't get access to any of the data. Uh, nobody would give me information. It's, it, the data, they just hold on to it. They don't want to show it away. And one day, uh, a staffer of Senator Kennedy, uh, Pre President Kennedy's brother, who recently died as a senator, uh, called me up and he said, well, we have this bill and we want to know this information. And I said, well, boy, I'd love to tell you, but I don't, I don't have the information that I need to answer that question. And he said, well, what do you need? And I said, well, you collect this data as part of the government. I don't have access to it. The next day, somebody from that area of the government called me. And from that day on, I can call and get the information that I need. And I have politicians, senators that I work with, and I have their numbers, and I can call them up, and, and they, are, they tell me, if you have anything that you think I want to see, call me, email me, let me know. And I, I have this video of uh, Senator Harkin, who's a senator from Iowa, holding up my research and talking about it on the Senate floor. And my mother was so proud. So. Um, <laughs> I'm very lucky in that respect. Most researchers, I don't think, have that uh, connection. And I think one of the reasons why I do is when I was brought to speak to the Senate at one point, a subcommittee of the Senate. And as I was doing a presentation like this, uh, Senator um, uh, McCain, who ran for president in a couple terms, asked me, what side of this are you on? He actually said, um, what dog do you have in this fight? And, uh, I, I'm sorry, sir, what was that? He goes, well, what side are you on? And I, I said, I'm not really on any side. I'm just a researcher. I, I, I'm interested in this. I work on both sides. And he said, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. But, but if you had a kid with disability, what, what program would they go in? And I said, sir, I'd do whatever my wife told me to do. <laughs> and he laughed. And he, you know, he kind of said, OK. And, I, and he saw some of my research that wasn't as positive about support and employment, uh, and some research that was. and and. From that moment on, they've been very, very good about calling me. They have any questions, they, they email. And if they have questions I can answer, they give me the data. I think one of the issues when dealing with policymakers is to answer their questions, not to tell them your answers. And I think that's something we forget about. Uh, so many in my, my field in the United States, uh, supportive employment is a religion for them. They are, all kids should be working in the community. And that's fine. I, I'm just interested. I just, I, my wife is an accountant and we talk about this and it's exciting and it's just what we do. Um, but 
these are your kids. I'm not going to be here to tell you what to do with your children. I just want to provide information for policymakers, and when they have a question, I answer it, and I think that they were very grateful in that respect. So um, there was just a, a, a news program where somebody was asking a, a senator, a congressperson, about research, and he mentioned me as being one of the three top people that they look towards for information. And I think one of the reasons is, is because I'm not selling them anything. It's, I, you know, I, it's, here's the answer, ask me the question, and here's the answer. One of the things that we often do now is trying to, rather than trying to persuade policymakers, is to say, what is it that you need to know in order to make an informed decision? What is it that you want to know? And then you give them that information. Is once they commit themselves to, I want to see how much this costs. I want to see how much this, uh, what outcomes you have. I want to see what kind of people you're working with. Fine, here you go. Once they made that commitment to that piece of information, it now means something to them. And I think that they're more likely to say, oh, okay, oh. I mean, they still kind of pick at me about, is this really true? And I have a laptop computer with six million people and the data that they've given me, and I say, okay, what do you want to know? And they sit and they go, and you have it right there? I have it right here. What, tell me what variables you want to look at. And, all, and then they look and it's, okay. Yeah. We're not selling things. This is a good bargain. This is good for everybody. No one can argue with that, really. It, working, good. You know, and for everybody. So it's not that we're trying to convince anybody. I think that's the approach that we need to take with, with parents and employers. It's something that they want. We just need to allow them to see that. You know, policymakers, believe it or not, uh, politicians want to do a good job. As much uh, fun as I, we make of them, uh, they have a hard job, but they want to do good things for our, our countries. The problem is they don't often know what those good things are. Uh, they hear so many things from different people, they don't know what to believe. So I don't talk to them about philosophy. I talk to them about facts and figures. I say, according to this data that you gave me, you spent $6 million on this and you got this outcome. You spent $8 million on this, you got this outcome, and so forth. And let them decide. Who am I? I'm, just, you know, I'm not that smart, but I can give them information. So let them make the decisions and I'll just give them what they need. <laughs>